It's the big one. Welcome along to GCN's preview of the 2019 Tour de France, where hopefully you'll be finding out all about the key stages and this year's key protagonists. This year marks the 106th edition of the biggest race on the cycling calendar. 3,460 kilometers in total, the traditional modern format of 21 stages over three weeks and two rest days. Uh, those are broken down into one team time trial, one individual time trial, five summit finishes, a further two days in the high mountains, seven sprint stages and five hilly or intermediate stages. Does that add up, Dan? I double checked this year, that's 21, I think. <laughs> Good maths. Uh, right, now because this year's race actually starts in Belgium, it seemed like an excellent excuse to come back to our favourite bar, the Strawberry Thief in Bristol, for beers, as well as the preview, of course. Uh, now, before we get on to the finer points of those stages, though, we have some good news for you, because as well as daily highlights of the race on our Facebook page, a lot of you have been asking for them on YouTube as well, and so your wish is our command. It is indeed. We've set up a brand new YouTube channel dedicated to all things racing. Uh, we're gonna to link to that at the end of this preview show, so you can head over there, press on the subscribe button, and press on the bell icon, so that you receive daily notifications when we've uploaded our highlights. Right then, let's take a closer look at this year's route. Uh, it all kicks off this coming Saturday, the 6th of July, in the Belgian capital of Brussels. It's in fact the 23rd time that the Tour de France has started outside of France itself. Uh, two full stages in Belgium before they head over the border. And there's no easing the riders in this year. After just over 40 kilometers of stage one, they're going to hit the famous cobbles of the Muir van Gerardsbergen uh, before shortly afterwards hitting the Bosberg. They are indeed cycling Graceland for me. It's quite unlikely though that those climbs will be as pivotal as they used to be in the Tour of Flanders. But on that opening day, it's gonna be a very nervous peloton trying to get into the base of those climbs. We are expecting it to be a bunch finish though, but when you look closely, the last 500 meters is slightly uphill isn't it? So it might be one for Caleb Ewan. If he gets it, he would be taking his first yellow jersey on the first stage of his first ever Tour de France, which would be quite an accolade, wouldn't it? It's quite early to start making predictions in our previous Well, season. mate, when you've got the, the form like I've got, I just can't <laughs> hold myself back. Well, he's certainly got a decent chance. One thing we do know is that finish is going to be chaotic, isn't it? Because a stage win at the Tour is huge. A stage win that guarantees you the race lead in yellow jersey is even huger it than that. Uh, it could be all changed though in the GEC the following day because that is a 28 kilometer team time trial around the streets of Brussels. Not completely flat either, so we could see some reasonably significant time gaps. We could indeed. Stage three, we head back into France via the Ardennes. We've got four categorized climbs coming late on in the stage. For me, that's got Julien Alaphilippe written all over yeah. it, and I can already see him on the podium. Well, it's got my name written all over the, that stage as well, because the start town of Vange has got a brewery, which I'm <laughs> currently trying to organise a piss up in, but struggling <laughs> ever so slightly. And in the finish, it's an Epine, where the champagne will surely be flowing. There's no way you'd make the finish, mate. We wouldn't be able to get you out of that brewery. Uh, now, those, that stage is the first one where there'll be climbs to unseat the sprinters, but unlike a traditional Tour de France, this one actually omits the whole of the cycling mad northwest of the country. Country. And actually, we hit a pretty major obstacle or two on stage six, which is super early, isn't it? That's right. You cannot afford to go into the Tour de France undercooked this year because that stage is a brute. There are seven classified climbs over the course of 160 kilometers. Uh, three of those are first category, including the one to the finish, which is one of my favorite climbs in the Tour de France, La Planche de Belfi at least to watch. <laughs> I did ride it once. It's seven kilometers long at 8.7%. Uh, it's still got that final 20% pitch up to the former finish line, but ASO found and introduced another piece of road, which is 24% and on gravel. Oh, that'll make it even harder, won't it? Make sure you get that date in your diaries then. Thursday, the 11th of July. The day after that is actually the longest stage in this year's Tour de France at 230 kilometers. One for the sprinters we're expecting. Before the following day, it's one of those really deceptive days because although there's no high mountains, over the 199 kilometers, there's actually 4,000 meters of ascent, which makes it one of those days where just about anything could happen. Could indeed. The next day, again, is relatively hilly. Could be one for the breakaway. Stage 10, we could expect to finish in a bunch sprint. And that gets us into Albi, which is the first rest day of this year's Tour de France. And I think 
the riders are really going to deserve to put their feet up after yeah. uh, racing for 10 days straight. Yeah, it's a long stint that to the first mm. rest day this year, isn't it? Uh, they will resume on the second Wednesday with another reasonably flat stage. Uh, but as they come into the finish that day going towards Toulouse, they're probably going to be able to see in the distance the Pyrenean Mountains they'll be tackling the following day. There are two first category climbs that day on stage 12, one of which is the Col de Perisord, and the day will finish with that long descent down into Bagnères de Bigorre. Last time that was used, 2013, where you might remember Dan Martin took his first stage win of the Tour yeah. de France mm -hmm. in front of Jakob Fulsang. Then, it's the race of truth. The <laughs> one and only individual time trial in this year's race, 27 hilly kilometers around Po. Then, the stage after that, the race really starts going skywards. Only a short stage, 117 kilometers, but finishing at the top of the Col de Tourmalet, 2,150 meters, remember, and it's going up the western slopes, which are, for Stats fans, 19 kilometers at 7.4%. Now, the Tourmalet, when it's normally included, is usually the highest point of the race. This year, it's actually only the fourth highest point in the race. Now, the organizers are calling it the highest race in the world. Presumably, they're only talking about the Tour de France, because I know for a fact both of you have ridden the Tour of Qinghai Lake, which, from memory, is twice as high. Yeah, and at least three times as grim. Possibly more, actually. I, that was my low <laughs> point in my cycling career. I well, passed out running up the stairs once in Qinghai. I think it's that high. I think you're right. I think the organisers are talking about the Tour de France yeah. on its own. And they're right from that point of view, because by Tour de France standards, this is a high altitude addition. There are a trio stage in the final week of the race, which they're going to be eye-watering if you're not a pure climber that was born at altitude. Uh, that trio stage starts on stage 18, where in fact three times they will go over 2,000 metres above sea level. Uh, those climbs are the Col de Var, the Col d'Isouard, and the Col de Galibier, which is 2,642 metres above sea level. Right, the next stage, we're on stage 19 now, is another short one, but again, two really big climbs in there. We've got the Col de Lizarin, which is 2,770 metres, the highest point in this is race, and often claimed as being the highest pass in Europe. Not entirely sure how accurate that one is, but there we go. Uh, and then, actually, the summit finish on that day is to team the ski resort, and that's over 2,000 metres as well, making it five climbs over 2,000 metres in succession. Now, the final stage of that trio is actually the penultimate stage of this year's race. 130 kilometers from Albaville to Val Torrens, 4,500 meters of climbing, culminating in the highest mountaintop finish of this year's race at 2,365 meters above sea level. Yeah, big one there. Yeah, you know, they don't have to finish there, right? So um, we've got a video coming up. Jeremy and I are heading out there because we found a gravel track that goes from the finish line right up to 3,100 meters above sea level. Imagine the tour finishing up there, it'd be amazing. Still not quite as grim as Qinghai Lake. No, no way near, no. <laughs> Although you could make that into a really epic climb because the one they're using in the Tour de France on that penultimate stage is 33 kilometers long, which is over 20 miles in old money. That's How really much do you add on to the end of it? It's like another seven or eight K, I think. Wow, you better nice. the riders know, they'd love to do that at the end of it. <laughs> that stage though, could be a stonker. If there's anything still to play for in the general classification on that stage, it could be a phenomenal one, couldn't it? In fact, with that trio stage being so hard, even someone that goes into them with what looks to be an unassailable lead could fall at the final hurdle. Yeah, here's hoping it's gonna remain exciting right up to the very end. Uh, speaking of which, actually, from the summit of Val Thorens ski station, Ryan's gonna be ushered very quickly back up to Paris for that final stage, most of it being a kind of parade, but then we have those finishing circuits on the Champs-Élysées, kind of like the unofficial Sprinters World Championships, which, if those previous three stages are anything like they sound on paper, it could end up being won by Naira Quintana. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it could indeed. Now, just to add a little bit more excitement this year, the organizers decided, in addition to the bonus seconds that we traditionally have at the finish line, they've taken eight select climbs, where they've put eight, five, and two seconds mm. at the top of those climbs. I think that's a good addition. Oh yeah, it's quite complicated, isn't it? But no, I know what you mean. Especially uh, if you're rubbish at maths. Well, right? exactly, well like all, actually no, both of us, Lloyd is quite good at maths, <laughs> weirdly. Uh, the first compliment I've ever had on the <laughs> channel from Sly. <laughs> Yeah, that's true, I'll take that back. Uh, right, now before we get on to the contenders, you might have noticed we are sporting some pretty fancy t-shirts, all of which have been inspired, so we've been able to tell this, by the French <laughs> flag. That's right. Uh, anyway, they're available now to buy on the GCN shop, which is shop.globalcyclingnetwork.com, remember. <laughs> 
Right, the contenders. Although actually, before we go on to uh, who is gonna win this year's race, we should probably talk about who can't win this year's race because they're not even gonna be there, most notably of which, Chris Froome, of course, four-time winner of the event, is gonna have to miss it following that horrific crash whilst previewing the time trial stage of the Criterium de Dauphiné. Without him there, he would have gone in clearly as favourite. It's going to be a very, very different race, isn't it? It is going to be a really different race this year, I think. The other notable absentee from a GC contender's point of view is Tom Dumoulin, who of course crashed heavily at the Giro d'Italia, which forced him to withdraw from that Grand Tour. And unfortunately, he's not recovered from the knee injury he sustained there in time for the Tour de France. It's been a season to forget, really, for Tom mm, Dumoulin so yeah. far. And actually, his absence also leaves Team Sunweb as a bit of a rudderless ship. Yeah, it's a good description. Yeah, and I don't think it's just them that are going to miss him. I think the race is going to miss him too, because mm. it's always a shame when you get to the Tour de France and the biggest names are not on the start line. But that said, maybe in particular with the absence of Chris Froome, it can potentially make it one of the most open Tour de France for years. True. Yeah, well, fingers crossed. Uh, right, then on to the actual contenders then. And on the entire start list, there's actually only two former winners who are gonna be on that start line. The first is, of course, last year's winner, Geraint Thomas. And then the other rider is Vincenzo Nibli. Of the two though, only one can be considered a contender for the yellow jersey. That would be Geraint Thomas. Vincenzo Nibli has already said that he's only gonna be looking at stage wins and possibly the polka dot jersey for the King of the Mountains. Yeah, but you can never trust a shark. <laughs> no, you can't. Now, I wouldn't be surprised that uh, going into the mountains, Nibali's lost no time at all and just takes it for there. From, for Garrett Thomas, though, it's going to be a big test because last year, it's not really unkind to say that perhaps last year, Garrett Thomas was a bit of a surprise winner and uh, he, he was surprised himself and really. He did make the most of his celebrations over the next well, few months. Well, he did, but that's fair <laughs> enough, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, if I had happened yeah. to have won the Tour de France that I competed in back in 2010, I'm pretty sure I would be celebrating to this very day. To be fair, Danny, it still looks, looks like, like you're like celebrating it. pretty hard for what? Well, why not? <laughs> yeah, I finished in the last 10 of the Tour de France. I'm going to celebrate that forever. <laughs> uh, right, for Thomas then, he's not had a win since last July at the Tour de France. And I think it's fair to say, it's not been plain sailing for his build up to this year's Tour de France. Had quite a low key start to the season, which is understandable. Uh, then he was forced to withdraw from Terreno Adriatico because he had stomach problems. Bounced back a little bit to take third at the Tour of Romandie at the end of April. But then at the Tour de Suisse, he crashed out reasonably early on, which means that we, and probably to an extent he, doesn't really know where he's at from a race form point of view even if I have an idea from the numbers that he's producing in training. It does make you wonder though, whether he's even gonna be the sole leader at Team Ineos, because one of his teammates is another than Egan Bernal, who has won this year, and he's won big, two of cycling's most prestigious one-week stage races in Paris-Nice and also the Tour of Switzerland. Now Bernal has stated that he will happily work for Geraint, but if Geraint is the stronger rider. And if he's not? Well, exactly, that's when things are gonna get interesting. Mm. Now, the other rider is Wout Pauls, because Wout Pauls could potentially do a good GC, yeah. given at how good he was at the Dauphiné as well. But away from Team Ineos, Movistar, and their three-pronged attack. So, Naira Quintana could complete his set of Grand Tours if he wins this one. Lander could start his if, at this point, he gets set free, and then, <laughs> You've got Alejandro Valverde as well, who's just uh, won at the Route d'Occitanie, yeah. to say that right, and get the pronunciation police out on that one. But he's looking as lean as I think. I think, I think, I think they're on the seen. phone already, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> he is looking really he's, lean. Yeah, yeah, so he could potentially be up there as well. Yeah. Well, he has stated that he's going to deliberately lose time in the first part of the Tour de France, so he can go for stage wins and help Quintana and Lander. Those were your tactics in 2010, weren't they, mate? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, lose time every single day. That's his tactic in every race. Though, unfortunately. <laughs> but I'm not sure I believe Valverde because I don't think I've ever seen him deliberately lose time in his entire career. So I'll believe that when I see it. For Quintana though, I just don't see it happening for him again mm. this year. He was off the pace at the Criterion de Dauphiné. His only win this year was back at the Tour Colombia. And I'm going to make a bold prediction now that he's not going to finish on the podium of the Tour de France. Ooh. Lander, though, that came back to haunt you, really, yeah, when he won it in 2012. Yeah. Lander, though, I'm very excited to see. If he's anything like the same Lander that we saw in the last half of the Giro d'Italia, he's going to cause havoc in the high mountains. They need to give him his chance as well. Mm. Yeah, they do. Then the third rider, uh, third person, sorry, on the list of favourites, at least from the bookies, is Jakob Fuglsang, mm. isn't it? Now, it's odd in one respect, seeing as he's not ever finished in the top five of any Grand Tour, let alone the Tour de France, 
But yet, when you look at the results he's got, even just this season, it's remarkably impressive, isn't it? Liège, Baston Liège, what a classic win that was. And also the Dauphiné, and in the latter, he never really looked like he was under pressure, did he? Not no. at all. And I was looking on pro cycling stats early. He's had 23 top 10s in 38 races and five big wins already this season. And it's just that sort of momentum that we've seen in recent years from Tour de France winners. Yeah. They're, they're always on top of it, never chasing form. Yeah. Oh, that's all true, but I just think it's a big step to go from, as Sai said, not finishing in the top five to winning the Tour de France, but we shall see. I'm not making any more predictions of who's not going to finish <laughs> on the podium. In fact, moving on, shall we talk France? Yes. yes. Could this be the first time in 34 years that we have a French winner of the Tour de France? No. Le <laughs> seemed to think that this is the only chance they've got. They had a headline last week on the front page which read, it's now or never. Yes. That's like the newspaper version of clickbait, isn't it, I think? <laughs> Unless they're planning to stop the Tour de France in 2019, it does seem a little bit drastic. They have uh, both Pino, uh, Thibaut Pino, sorry, and also Roman Bardet this year, both of whom uh, are genuine contenders, aren't they? Of the two, you've got to say perhaps Pino is the more likely of the two. Judging on form this year, I'd say. Yeah. Well, exactly, yeah. but. I personally would probably rather bet on Bardet, maybe. I would, for one, love to see a French winner. I think yeah. the fans have been really, really patient since, what, 85? Yeah, but do you think there will be a French winner? Uh, no. Oh. So, how are you thinking? <laughs> I agree with you though, I think the fans would absolutely love it. I mean, there's no doubt that if Pino and Group R MFTJ dominated the Tour de France this year, he probably wouldn't have piss thrown at him the <laughs> no. following year, would he, by the fans? Probably Grigio. Oh, Pino Grigio. Yes. That's terrible. Yeah. Well, what about if Roman wins? Could be Bardet. National Bardet? Yes! Oh, nice. I oh, know. That's just awful. <laughs> you know, moving swiftly along, we've got to talk about Richie Port. The door is certainly open for him. No? Door? Yeah. Port? No? Okay. Oh, I see what you did there. Yeah, like yes. that. Yeah. That's good, that's good, mate. In all seriousness, though, you've got to say, Richie Port has been far from his best this year. He's had that almost compulsory win on Wollonga Hill. But again, at 34, mm. you've got to say for Port, it's now or never. Absolutely. His team, though, got every confidence. Uh, Trek, say, Fredo said they are 100% behind him, which, uh, well, it's either confidence or uh, they haven't got any other options. But anyway, <laughs> EF Education First, they are stacked with big hitters this year, aren't they? Which is nice to see, actually. They've said that they're going to be all in behind Rigoberto Aran. So that'll be illustrious domestiques and the like of TJ Van Garder and also Michael Woods. Regardless of a GC outcome, it's hard to see that team coming away without a stage win, isn't no, it? Very true. And the same, in fact, could be said for Jumbo Visma, who've had over 30 wins within their team so far in 2019. Uh, from a general classification perspective, they are going to be led by Steven Kreisweit, the Dutchman who's probably best remembered for losing the Giro d'Italia after he crashed into a snowball. Yeah, what a way to go, though. I know. In fact, I'd love to see him on the podium of the Tour, yeah. just to sort of half make up for that. Definitely. And Mitchelton Scott, they're throwing everything into this one behind Adam Yates, fourth here in 2016. He did look good at the Dauphiné as yeah. well, until unfortunately he succumbed to that stomach bug on the final stage. Yeah. Other riders that we got a note, um, just to make sure we cover every base going. <laughs> uh, the uh, two Bora Hansgrohe riders, we've got Emmanuel Buchmann and also uh, Patrick Conrad. Um, they could both do something. And then... Um, Rowan Dennis. Rowan Dennis. How did you know I was thinking of Rowan Dennis? Well, he's been amazingly, isn't he? He's, he's been climbing really well at the Tour de Suisse. So well that I knew he was going to make it onto the end of your predictions for GC contenders. <laughs> yeah, lastly, uh, possibly worth a cheeky little bet on Dan Martin. His odds are 100 to 1, which seems mm. remarkably long for a rider of his calibre. But there you go. Yeah. Right, we're going to move on to the sprinters very quickly. We're expecting most of those battles to probably be between Dylan Groenewegen and Elia Viviani. Uh, the Dutchman from Jumbo Visma has had 10 wins already in 2019. Viviani has only had six, but he did bounce back remarkably impressively after a disappointing Giro d'Italia to take two stage wins at the Tour de Suisse. He did indeed, and they've only come up against each other once this year at the three days of De Panna. Which is one day. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And Groenewegen got the better of that one. But the other rider is Kayla Buen. Um, we've got to talk about it. He had a fantastic Giro, winning on both the flat and impressing in those uphill stage yeah. finishes as well. So, uh, yeah, he could have a great tour. Yeah, it's his first Tour de France, so you've got to imagine he's going to be chomping at the bit, isn't he, to get his uh, win yeah. off the mark. Certainly chomping on his front tyre, such oh, is yeah. his sprinting style. Uh, Peter Sagan, 
how can you not mention Sagan in the list of sprinting favourites? He maybe might not take as many stages in the past, but you can't see him finishing outside the top three on just about any stage that's not a high mountain one. Uh, and then the other notable rider, Andre Greipel. Now, in his career, he's won 11 stages at the Tour de France. However, the last of those was three years ago, and he has yet to take any victory at all for his new team, Arkea Samsic, this year. So perhaps maybe his time has passed? Well, I'm going to have to correct you there, Si. Greipel has had a win this year, which you will remember when I say it to you, at the Tropica and Misa Bongo stage race in February. <laughs> uh, Didn't one forget man, that one. One other sprinter who has had a big win this year in Ghent Wevelgum is Alexander Kristoff. And of course, he won on the Champs Elysees last year against the odds at the time, so you can't count him out for no. the sprint stages. Uh, Kofidis will have Christophe Laporte definitely for the sprint, possibly Nasser Buani too, if they select him. And then there's one man whose name we've missed out so far, who's won more stages than any other rider at the Tour de France of his generation, Mark Cavendish. Can you see him winning one this year though? I'm not sure. I mean, he's still not back to his best after his second bout with the Epstein Barr virus. Yeah. And in two and a half years, he's had just one win. And you can never really count Cav out, but he needs to get himself to the Tropical and miss a bongo. Yeah, definitely. Rack up a couple. Yeah, I, it would be a shame, but I, I'd love to see him take one, but I don't think mm. this year is going to be his year. No, reluctantly, I've got to agree with you, but I would like to see us wrong in this respect. Mm. Um, anyway, regardless of the out and out sprinters, what about the other riders that are going to be in the mix for stages? I mean, it's an epic list, isn't it? We've got Julian Alaphilippe, we've got Wout van Aert, excitingly enough. We've got Warren Barguil. Yeah, Michael uh, Matthews as well. Michael Sunweb. Matthews, of course. Yeah, he could save Sunweb's day, couldn't he? We're going to be in for an epic, epic three weeks. Yeah, but to see who's in for a hellish three <laughs> weeks, it's time for the GCN predictions. Ooh, Ooh. kiss of death. Egan Bernal. It goes over 2,000 metres regularly, and he is going to profit from that. My prediction for this year's Tour de France, Alejandro Valverde. Jakob Fulsan is going to bring home the bacon for Denmark. All right, my prediction is Garen Thomas. Even though he's not raced much, a lot of people are doubting him because of that. But at the Tour of Romandie, he hadn't raced much, and his form was very impressive against Primoz Roglic, who was in, as we saw, peak form for the Giro d'Italia, which just came after that. So I think it's not going to be a problem for him. I think he can get into great shape, and he was looking lean before he left the Tour de Suisse. So, G, you my man. Adam Yates. Mainly because I wanted to choose Egan Bernal, but Dan got there first. Uh, my prediction for the Tour de France this year is, I think it's a really wide open tour. I'd love Geraint Thomas to win a second tour, but I don't think he's going to. I'm going to go for a slightly outside bet, which seems mad considering his past history in the race, Nibali. Right, uh, those are our predictions, but as ever, we'd like to hear your predictions for who's going to win the Tour de France this year. Uh, you can put those in the comment section below this video, preferably before the race starts this coming Saturday, because yeah. I know what you lot are like. Often no they come in after the race is finished. No, no right. predicting everyone like Dan as well. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a good point. Uh, remember, of course, that you can watch the highlights of every stage of the Tour de France. Make sure you subscribe to our new channel for that. And also, as well as the Tour de France, it's the biggest race on the women's pro calendar, the Giro Rosa. And we've got highlights of that every day. And you can watch the preview show with myself and former riders Danny Rowe and Merlin Noriega from GCN Español. And you can do that by clicking right down here.